Welcome back to Nate the Hate, where I am joined once again by our Australian mate, MVG. Say hello. What's going on, Nate? Great to be back on the show. It's always great to have you. And today we have a pretty deep topic to dive into. And it's definitely been a topic that's it's been hot this week because everyone's curious as what's going to happen to E3 later this year. We've had GDC canceled. We've had Tai Pai games canceled. We have numerous events. Even today, Twitch Amsterdam was canceled. And now E3 and the ESA are in, you know, they're in the target. And earlier this week, ESA put out a statement concerning the situation where they said, everyone is watching the situation very closely. We will continue to be vigilant as our first priority is the health, wellness, and safety of all of our exhibitors and attendees. Given what we know at this time, we are moving ahead full speed with E3 2020 planning. Exhibit and registration sales are on track for an exciting show in June. So that came out and people said, well, we have three months, really nothing to worry about. But the situation changed drastically come Wednesday when Los Angeles declared a state of emergency and the ESA came out and they put out a new statement where they said, the health and safety of our attendees, exhibitors, partners, and staff is our top priority, while the ESA continues to plan for a safe and successful E3 show June 9th through 11th of 2020, we are monitoring and evaluating the situation daily. Now, those two statements, you know, they're very different in tone, very different in overall delivery. And but it maintains the core focus of we're taking it day by day. And then just yesterday, another, another devastating hit came to the ESA in E3 when I am 8-Bit went to Twitter and made the announcement that they are resigning as creative directors of E3. And, you know, the tone of their overall message was negative. It did not sound like they left on good terms. The ESA put out a statement saying they thanked I am 8-Bit for their contributions and that they're still excited about E3. All of this is very concerning, to say the least. And what are your first thoughts on the state of E3 2020, given these recent developments? I think um, it's in a lot of trouble, Nate. You know, based on everything you just said. Plus, we can't discount what's been happening over the last eight, nine months since the last E3 2019 where there was a significant doxing that occurred, which the ESA really never came out and apologized for and, and said, you know, we screwed up, we, we're going to do better. They, they did come out and say, we will be tightening security and our website is a lot more secure. And <laughs> they did a couple of things, right? But they never really addressed the issue. They never really, you know, personally, or maybe they did, you know, behind closed doors, but they at least from a public standpoint, they did not come out and, and really kind of admit that they messed up on that one. They, they kind of tried to pass it off as a hacking attempt. And really, it, it really hurt their credibility. And a lot of people, a lot of media people are still very unhappy about that and, and the way that that was handled. So they kind of came out of that with a lot of bruises. And, and kind of in January... There was talk about you know E3 is coming coming 2020. It's and they you know the ESA started their marketing for E3 2020. And I remember back then, you know people like Jason Schreier were were talking about how E3 was in its worst shape that it's ever been in. Last year was half empty, and you know there was a lot of disappointment you know from from last year's show. Which incidentally, I attended last year as well, so I've got some, I've got my own thoughts on on the show. But and then we had Sony, you know, pull out of out of E3, completely unrelated to the the events of of this week with IM8 Bit and the state of emergency that was that was announced. But Sony decided that they would no longer be attending E3 this year for their own reasons, and I think their reasons were quite valid in that they want to do things their own way, which is totally fine. And then we had uh, Jeff Keighley, you know, throw his ring in and say he's not going to be attending either. He's not going to be doing his thing. Now, 
Keeley's a hype man, so does it really matter if Keeley's there or not? Not really. I mean, it doesn't really... I don't think it hurts the show from, you know, the way the the show w- would be run from an agenda standpoint, but it does, from a credibility standpoint, ask okay. questions about, well, why? Why is he pulling out, you know? And I think to your point, like, I, I am 8-bit. I think there was some some personal issues there that we'll probably never really understand or, or hear about about why so even before this week e3 was kind of i don't want to say on life support because it's been a show that's been going on for 25 years and they've gone through a lot of things over the years it's not always been in la they've had it in other places and you know every year there's always going to be a significant amount of of things to be done in order to mount another show and i think this year is no different but this week now obviously with i am 8-bit removing themselves out of the equation and we're what three months before the show starts i mean that's that's hardly any time at all in order to to pivot and and change direction quickly and attempt to get a new creative director on board in order to kind of get the show going and i i think honestly nate i i think that everyone's kind of expecting e3 to or the esa to cancel e3 this year and I would agree. I, I think that I think that the right move for E three twenty twenty is is to is to cancel it for this year. I'm not saying it needs to go away completely. I think there's definitely and we can talk about it here shortly, but there's definitely some things we can do later or they can do later to you know, to, to become relevant again to, to bring the show back to where it needs to be. But I do think that this year is is just not looking good for the show and I think the right thing to do is to cancel the show, considering there has been a lot of other cancellations of other, you know, shows, not not as big as E3, but a lot of shows throughout the country and indeed throughout the world. So I think, yeah, let's let's get it cancelled and and the ESA should really regroup and think about what, what the next move is. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you there, because right now it seems like it's just a snowballing effect for the ESA and E3. And it started last year with like the doxing situation, and then it turns into, like, as you mentioned, Jeff Keighley pulling out. Now I am 8-bit as creative directors. It just seems like there's really, there's been no positive momentum for E3 2020 over those last few months. And if I'm a journalist who was doxxed due to the ESA's incompetence, I have to stop and wonder to myself right now, this was a company or an organization who didn't care about my security. What part of... The situ- ongoing situation right now makes me think that they actually care about my health. Right. Like, I have to put that, you know, that's definitely a question I'd, I'd have in the back of my mind. And, like, I agree that they should either postpone E3, given the situation in LA and I am Apit's exodus. But we also have to remember that E3 makes up the e- about 50% of the ESA's budget. So this is a substantial event for them. They they basically need it. Mm-hmm. Without E3, the ESA's overall budget, what they make, their revenue, is you know, now it's going to be it's gonna be shortchanged significantly. I mean fifty percent is that's a lot of money. which way will will kind of hurt them more though? Like if if the if publishers start pulling out and kind of forcing their hand, or do you think it's better if the ESA gets it gets in front of it? and says we're canceling e3 i think if if the esa comes out first and they say we're canceling e3 i think it saves face because if e3 2020 is canceled by the esa first and they say you know we're reevaluating our situation we're going to talk with publishers we're going to talk to members of the media like Jeff Keighley, so we can come up with a new focus and we're going to basically rebrand and relaunch ourselves in 2021. That looks good for the industry. If they wait and they basically pull a GDC where the publishers start to pull out on their own accord and then opt to do digital events like a Nintendo Direct, what you're going to see is publishers realize that they're going to, they would save themselves considerable money by not attending E3. And basically that 
they're not losing all that much by not being there. Because yeah. we've seen Nintendo go with the direct route. We've seen Sony now do with the state of plays and Sony just exit E3 altogether. Is that if E3 is canceled due to the publisher with the drawal, I think that would almost seal the deal or seal the door on E3 as a whole. I think you'll see a lot of publishers shift to that Nintendo Direct style conference and then they're going to realize the cost savings and that there's really no reason to go back to E3 as it is today. Mm -hmm. What, what about the people. um what about the the meetings that go on? So there's the there's the right. fan stuff, there's the the direct style stuff where the the announcements are made, but at at things like GDC and E3 there's a lot of business meetings that go on. There's a lot of deals that get done. There's a lot of contracts that get signed. Um, if you talk to any publisher, they will they would most likely be book solid for the entire event with with meetings for for different things. What about those types of things? How how do those things get get kind of mitigated or or how do those things occur if a show like E three doesn't doesn't exist in in twenty twenty? See, that's that's a difficult question because one thing I don't think a lot of people re really factor in is really as you put it like the grand scale that E3 is like a lot of us especially like people listening the fans they want to see the announcements they want to see those conferences but behind the scenes as you said that's where the publishers and developers they're meeting they're signing deals and if E3 does not exist the way I see that impacting those type of situations, basically, I think there would need to be a an industry replacement of sorts. It'd have to almost return to just maybe its trade show roots. Yeah. Where it's no longer that fan spectacle that they've been turning it into, where it's just basically a goes back to like kind of what GDC still is. It's where professionals get to network. It's where I get to meet with you know, if I'm an independent developer, I get to meet with publisher Y and say, this is a project I'm working on. They express interest. I networked with them. Now maybe, you know, I take some business cards. We get in contact over email. We book a meeting with each other at a later date where either I fly to them, they fly to me. And then we hash out a deal with E3 possibly becoming irrelevant due to the events that are transpiring. Maybe we see gdc take over that type of role in terms of networking mm -hmm. but it's would be really tough to say what would happen if if e3 ceased to exist especially from the industry's point because it's been such a it's been such like a staple of the industry for so long that pretty much any modern day developer has been at e3 and they have networked yeah and we've seen some of it appear on twitter some publishers and even developers were expressing their concerns about what could happen if E3 did cease to exist and how they would be affected by the lack of networking opportunities. And I mean, GDC's cancellation this year has definitely hurt some publishers' bottom lines where they were hoping to meet with developers or, in, or even meet with console manufacturers to find out maybe next-gen plans, sign deals. Because I mean, we know Sony and Microsoft have been out there signing you know, indie studios for maybe an exclusive game release or even an acquisition. Now, those type of talks would have been, you know, hindered by not having GDC and they could be further hindered if an E3 does not take place. Yeah. If you were the head of the the ESA, Nate, and you were, you were sitting in your office today wondering where, where things should go, what would you do? Would you cancel E3 for 2020? Knowing that knowing that and this is important knowing that if you did cancel it that the pressure to bring it back for 2021 and the resistance that potentially would occur because everyone's moved to the direct style of pre-recorded you know live streams or or whatever they've, they've done would really take over this year and you know do you worry that well maybe Maybe that's the way that Nintendo, Microsoft, Sony are going to continue to do things, and there's no real reason to have the show anymore. I think that I think that's my biggest thing with E3 right now is that 
I feel like if they pull out, then they're really worried whether they'll be able to bring it back, where they'll get the support right. of, of the companies and bring it back for, for next year. So if you were if you were the, the head honcho there at the ESA, what, what would you do? That's a tough decision, and I do not envy the head <laughs> of the ESA for having to make this type of decision. Because it's, as you said, if I cancel it, and the publishers and developers do go to a digital format like a Nintendo Direct and a State of Play in Microsoft's, what do they call their Xbox thing? Oh, the, I don't even, um... <laughs> yeah, it's so <laughs> lackluster, I can't even recall what they actually name it. But if we see that a lot more from other companies, now I as ESA have to sit there and say, well, shit, they produce their own digital event, they reached out to their fans, they directly connected to the consumer, and it cost them a lot less than what we charge for a booth. And now I have to fear that they are real, that those companies are going to realize you don't need me anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's for any company, that's your biggest fear is when someone realizes I don't need your product anymore. I can reach out to more people without you and it's gonna cost me a lot less. So I guess if I'm, if I was the head of the ESA and my main mission is to prove relevancy of my event I would have to sell the idea to the publishers that my event is one of the biggest expos in North America. That's also an international event where we have developers and fans coming in from Japan and Europe, Canada, yeah. Mexico, where they get hands on time with your product, which your digital event cannot deliver. Now the counter to that is we have PAX East, PAX West, PAX South, Tokyo Game Show, Gamescom. So what makes E3 special? Mm -hmm. and if I'm the ESA head, I don't have an answer to that immediately. Yeah. Because, I, like, where do you go? Yeah, I I think the show absolutely needs to evolve or die. You know, it's it's really, it's at a point now where it's almost like it's its hand has been forced because the the Sony thing and the Jeff Keighley thing and the doxing thing, I mean, all of those things were pretty significant events that, that occurred, right. but they certainly weren't out, out for the count. You know, there was no knockout punch there. All those, the Sony one really, really hurt them, I think. But yeah, Sony definitely put them in a daze. Yeah. Jeff Keighley was like that jab. Then Sony came in with like a pretty heavy haymaker. Yeah. Now you're kind of wobbling. Yep. And now it kind of feels like, is that final hit? Like, is this the asteroid coming in yeah. to make E3 extinct? Right. So I think they have to really come up with, with something. But I don't think it's a difficult solution, you know. And I, I think we're probably saying the same thing in that, for me, going back to the industry-only event... So let's let's take the fans out of it. And there's probably going to be some people that listen to this that aren't going to like like what I say, but you know, get get the fans out of E3 because it was never really a fan show to begin with and offer, you know, a virtual ticket type of thing where it's like the the BlizzCon thing where you can you can kind of buy a virtual ticket and then you can basically live stream the entire show from many different you know um, angles of w whatever you want to see there from the comfort of your own home while the actual business of the the industry trade show is going on at the event i think that would really you know help that the esa r get their credibility back get get you know the publishers back on 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 track and uh, on board with, with with what they're trying to do but unfortunately i don't really see that happening because we're the ESA has has kind of shown, especially in the last twelve months, that they want to move towards that. And I hate this word, but you know they want to they want to move to that YouTuber influencer type thing, oh. where they they kind of invite you know these big influencers to to the show, and then have the, those people report on what's going on there and and you know you know rack up hundreds of thousands of views yeah. on, on their channels and and i don't really agree with that at all i mean i think 
E3 has always been an industry industry show and I think it really needs to go back to that. You know, the, the time for the YouTuber, the, the influencer, the Instagram person, they can be easily done at one of many other shows that are going on, you know, throughout the calendar year. It, it really doesn't need to be this one. I think this one is is one that just needs to go back to basics, get it back to the way, the way it used to be. And, and uh-huh. I think that will really would really help their credibility in the, in the long run. Yeah, I agree with that. I would almost want to see the ESA possibly explore the idea of the E3 that we know in June. I mean, I remember when E3 used to be in May. Mm-hmm. I mean, and all I all we knew at that time was E3 is this week. And the only thing you would get is you'd have to check IGN, EGM, GameSpot, and you'd see their E3 week news column. It might be like 10 stories at the end of the first day. And that's the that's the only information you got. You had to wait for them to report it, do their hands on, because there was no live streaming. They would very rarely even release the trailers they showed to the media at E3 because it was a media event. It was closed doors. So I would like to see them maybe explore the idea of here's E3 week. Those first, let's see, I think it's four days now. Make those first three days just industry. Yeah. Maybe like start it on the Monday, do the Monday through Friday, but have Monday, maybe even through Thursday or at least through Wednesday, just have it industry only allow the meetings. The meetings can take place all week, but have Mm -hmm. media only on the show floor so they can get their footage. They can do their interviews. They can get their coverage. And if you want the influencers and the fans who buy their $1,000 ticket, to be allowed in on Thursday and Friday, then have those two days be the, your public days. Mm. You get your money, you get your fans interest. They can, you know, Nintendo can get some demos with the general public, which I mean, in reality, they don't need E3. They host their own events. They are basically at every single PAX. So they don't need E3 to connect to the general populace. But like, that's the only real solution i could see the esa possibly considering it if they want to me- you know mesh both cuz they put out that statement for e3 2020 with the influencer and all the youtube stuff that basically they're trying to make it hip yeah and as like a member of the industry that's not good for me that's just that's just more people getting in my way that's right and i mean i know that sounds that sounds entitled. It sounds condescending. It's really not though, Nate, because I've heard that from a lot of journalists will say the same thing. Jason Shrys ha- has said a similar thing. Alana Pierce has, has said the same thing. I mean, you know, I think the biggest frustration really is trying to get your business done at an event like that when there's literally thousands of public people there as well and it really makes things very difficult sometimes in order to get to get you know your job done because you're either being stopped while you're walking to the next meeting which is probably on the other side of the convention hall which so it's a good 5 to 7 minute walk anyway and then you know there's there's always going to be someone that's trying to you know get a, an autograph or or a, a photo with 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 someone or so i think those things are absolutely real scenarios so i don't think there's really any entitlement there i think that's that's a a source of frustration for some of the the media people that i've spoken to yeah it definitely is and i mean some some may know this many probably don't but before e3 takes place there is an, an event it's called judges week where select members of the media are shown some of the games that are present at e3 early so that they can get hands on time they can already prepare previews and they can basically prepare the awards they're going to give out at E3. Now, this is a very exclusive list. It's limited. It's not open to a lot of people. It's mostly the bigger websites. So, like, even with the existence of Judges Week, it means the ESA and the E3 organizers recognize that the event is too cluttered. And... Basically, I mean, we can see, as I said, E3 accounts for 50% of their budget. At the end of the day, it's still about dollars. And the ESA is not going to give up profits 
if it means they're going to cut attendance from 66,000 to, let's say, I could see easily cut that in half if they were more strict on the media they allow in. Like they're not going to cut that. But we also have to remember that media is not charged for a badge. Mm -hmm. And they could easily, if I was the ESA head, I think I would actually evaluate that and say, we're not giving out free badges for media. If you want to send 25 people from your website, the badge is just for a round number, $100. It will cost you $2,500 to send the 25 people to E3, which previously cost you nothing. Yeah. So now, would there probably be pushback from websites if that type of policy was enacted? Yes, because now they have to budget that into their expenses. But, I mean, why should you, why should it be free to you? <laughs> right. I mean, at the end of the day, it's still a trade show. To attend, it costs money. It, it costs Nintendo money to make a booth there. I mean, I was just at PAX East. I was talking to numerous developers and one of the developers volunteered information to me of how much it cost them to get a, I believe the dimensions of their booth was a 10 by 12. It cost them just for PAX East, mm -hmm. $10,000. Wow. That's, that's, man, that's a lot of money. That's more than I thought it would, would cost. Right. And every box they had shipped to the Boston Convention Center cost them two hundred dollars. Wow. So they actually made the decision of we're not gonna ship a lot of stuff to the center. We're going to see if we can just do local pickup at like a UPS store or we're going to ship it to like our hotel if we can, because they they had a lot of boxes. Yeah. But like I mean it's a four day event. I understand I understand the luxury of a PAX East and a PAX West, especially for like smaller developers, because you get to have, you know, 50,000 fans come and demo your game. And that's exposure that is actually a lot better than what E3 provides, because E3, and I know people are going to disagree with this. When we talk about E3, what companies come to your mind? Uh, Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, you know, the big players. Um... Square Enix, Bethesda, all, right. the, all the big boys, you know. You don't think about any of those mid-tier developers who have booths, who are there meeting with media because E3 cannibalizes. Mm -hmm. every, every company at E3 cannibalizes each other. And that's why you see Microsoft say, we're going to have our event on Sunday. It's why you had Sony. Sometimes Microsoft and Sony would swap days. It'd be Sunday for Microsoft Monday yeah. for Sony or vice versa. And you always have Nintendo Tuesday morning. They always try to find a time when no one is competing with them because come Tuesday afternoon or Tuesday morning, the second those doors open to the show floor, nobody has the spotlight on them anymore. Right. Right. In some ways the shows, the show's kind of over, you know, because I mean, sure that there's, there's, some announcements that that occurred during those those days but for the most part everything that was meant to be unveiled has been unveiled and really now it's you know let's let's get the public in there and and you know that's really about it there's really not much else that happens after that obviously there's the treehouse and and things where you get more of a hands-on look at some of the games that are being built but yeah i mean at, at that point it's really for the public in, in so many ways it's the show's it's, almost over for, for the industry folks. Right. And that's the thing, like, for the public, they really just want to see the conferences. Everything else is for the industry folks. So as the head of the ESA, I don't need the public there anymore. I just need to really broadcast, you know, those four or five conferences from the big players. Like, Devolver Digital does their humorous little skit, which... It doesn't, they could do that anytime. It doesn't need to be at E3. They just do an E3 week to take advantage of the publicity. And like, that's where I think the ESA has to really evaluate the situation moving forward and just say, we can still put on the show for the public. Mm -hmm. We just maybe do that digital ticket. Just, just no more. If it's, they can have, like you kind of see on Twitch. ESA can just have their own stream where unfortunately they would kind of have to monopolize 
things a little more where it's, if they're going to have interviews with developers or publishers, you have to pay that 10, you know, that 10 bucks a day right. to see those events. Cause you know, obviously Nintendo is still going to put their direct on YouTube because in all reality, it has nothing to do with E3. It's just the timing. Yeah. And they like to call it their E3 direct. Sony is not there. Microsoft is actually off site. Mm -hmm. So, but if I'm square, Square's typically at E3 itself. EA is off site. So it would really be if the ESA wanted to do something more like that of we're going to talk to all these people. It's $10 to watch it. But then I guess you run into the, another issue where if I'm the publisher, what's stopping me from doing my own treehouse? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it does with everything that's happening this year, the doxing. I think it's just it's really showing the antiquated decaying bones that E3 has become in a more fleshed out manner. Do you and, think do you think that with I am eight bits exit and with we'll say three months to go before E3, do you think there is enough time to get a new creative director in place and and mount something in that time that's actually a a good show? No. Yeah. I think any creative director they bring in at this point is to going to have to build off of whatever I am a bit left behind and do their best to scrap together the best show they can. But I think if E3 does happen, you're going to like a rushed any like any rushed product, be it a movie, video game or anything, you're going to see those flaws. If the show does go on, you're going to see where they did not have time to finish ideas. And it's like, I wouldn't even, I would just revert to what E3 2019 was and say, this is the best we could do. Yeah, right. It's funny because when everything was going down in the, in the media with LA County's announcement and E3's statement two days ago that it was business as usual on the same day, I got an email from E3 saying, hey, don't forget to uh, to get registered for 2020. So it's almost, and I get it, it's, it's an automated email. So, you know, an automated email is an automated email, but it's just, it's it's very bemusing to me that that all this is kind of going on at the same time because in in one way, the ESA is coming out in the press and saying, we're monitoring the situation so far we haven't made any any decisions but you know we'll we'll let everyone know what we decide but to the folks that were in attendance last year they're trying to get them to sign up for for this year and i do feel like that they need to to really come out and and make a a statement not a hey we're monitoring it a look you know we're, we're going to have this or we're not going to have this. And if we are going to have this, then these are the things that we're going to going to do. I think they really need to be more transparent about how they're going to get this show mounted if if indeed it does happen. But I do agree with you, Nate. I, I, I think that, that it's probably not going to happen. In fact, I kind of made a little, you know, bet with myself that I think i would I, I honestly i would give it like 48 hours business hours not 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 the weekend but i would say 48 hours i i, I give it so i would say early next week i i think they're going to cancel wow. the show honestly I, 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 I just can't see i just can't see any way that they could possibly have the show this year given the situation i think i'd give them until i give them until about the first or second week of april i'd give them another month to salvage and evaluate everything happening and then i could see them canceling it because in a month's time like the situation with la maybe you know state of emergency is over depending on how thorough cleaning and mm -hmm. everything goes on there i the only thing i could see that maybe could speed it up is if you have a company like microsoft or nintendo or even square say 
we are not having a show floor presence. Well, it goes back to what we, we were talking about, whether they get in front of it and and just right. cancel it and let all the publishers know, hey, let's let's get in a get in a room together and figure out how we can make it really good for next year and, and take the time to really plan out 2021 or wait for big name publishers to start dropping off like GDC and force their hand. And look, history right. will tell us maybe that's the way things will go. <laughs> but I also feel like we're on the verge, man. We're on the cusp of, of the ESA saying, you know what, we, we, we can't possibly have this this year. So we may as well just, you know, put a stop to it right now and, and regroup and, and think about the future. Right. Right. Like, I think I could see them waiting just for one company to pull out and then they're going to say, okay, we're getting ahead of it. Done. Because you can't like GDC waited too long and it snowballed where every company was out and GDC was still kind of sitting there like no it's still happening and then <laughs> I was like oh like no we have to we have to kill it at the end of this week because mm -hmm. now it has completely snowballed out of our control and we basically we cannot spin this as a positive thing anymore because everyone's gone and right now E3 it's still on that fine line of the trapeze. They're kind of like, they're definitely leaning to fall. They're just waiting for that extra gust. And all it's going to take is just that one company, be it a Japanese or an American company to say, we're not attending E3. Like, I think if Sony came out right now, had they not done it back in January or had they not pulled out even last year, if Sony came out today, I said, we are not attending E3. I think the corporate suits at the ESA would be in panic mode and they'd be gathering and saying, what do we do? Because mm -hmm. now they'd be concerned. So it's definitely, I give them a month. If nothing changes in the situation within North America, Japan, LA, if none of that changes, it's, I definitely see E3 being canceled. And even if that does improve, and we still need to, we still need to see structural and foundational changes to E3 that only the ESA can make. And from what we have seen from those memos early this year about making it influencer friendly, I don't see that going over well with a lot of the publishers. Because, like as we brought up earlier, it costs millions of dollars to go to E3 for these companies. And if they basically realize, which I'm sure it's going through their corporate minds right now, I can host a digital event. We've seen Nintendo and Sony already do it. We can do that event. We can connect to our consumer directly at our terms. It saves us a lot of money. We don't need E3 anymore. And influencers are not the answer. I know people love them. Yeah, But I mean, I don't go to YouTube or Twitter or Instagram and I see um, frat boy John with his, you know, with his hat saying, yo, e-fuel, e it's good for you. <laughs> I, I rock gaming with this crap. And I'm like, yeah, I got to buy some of that gamer fuel. That's cool. No, I sit there saying, like, come on, guy. I see the ad hashtag at the end of your post. You don't drink it. You got $15,000 to say you love it. We know it's an ad and ads are fine. Sponsorships are fine, but I don't need you at the EA booth. Be like, I love, what's the name of this game? Need for speed. Cause EA already did that one year where the influencer <laughs> couldn't even say the name of the game and it looked embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. So like that doesn't help anybody. And if that's the direction E3 goes in, then I still think we're ultimately right. Then E3 as it was is dead. Mm -hmm. And like, no matter what E3 dies in some form, Right. It, it's not the Christmas of gaming anymore. It's either going to be commercialized to the point where they should just air it on Spike TV, which nobody would want, or you have to transition and revert back to what you used to be and just do an industry trade show, which it isn't right now. So it's dead as it is today. And it's going to go back to something that fans probably aren't going to be too enthused about because they're no longer the primary audience. Or you have to do the hybrid of we are E3 for five days. 
three or four of those days are just industry and maybe 36 hours are open to the fans and i mean i think the fans will still hate that even though they are given an opportunity but i just don't see any direction that is a clear win for the esa at this point what about and and maybe this is the last question but what about the scenario nate where you know it's it's on as normal but no one buys a ticket like a lot of the public just don't go because of the situation that's going on right now where ticket sales are let's say one third of what they were last year and there is i won't say a significant loss being made but there is a loss that has occurred on on the sales do you think that would have any impact on on how they would respond for next year I'd want to say yes, but I think based on how the ESA has handled so many situations, I think they are arrogant and ignorant enough that they would just view it and say, well, LA had a state of emergency that scared people away. Mm -hmm. And can't say it's not a valid reason, but I could see them using that as a deflector instead of actually reflecting inward and saying where are we failing because i mean that's that seems to be the company's or the organizer's biggest flaw is they're just not looking at themselves saying where did we go wrong they're basically like even the doxing situation as you said they didn't even look at themselves and say we failed you it was well people try to hack us like no the file was open for anyone to access yeah you didn't need to hack anything own up that you were lazy and you were incompetent in your website design and you didn't protect anyone's privacy yeah i I agree with that and that that situation really still bugs me a lot as someone who did attend last year um i I feel you know pretty unhappy about it and I, i can't only imagine how many others felt about it and some others ended up getting you know, they got they got text messages on their phones and they got doxxed and all that stuff. It's really, really inappropriate and just completely unacceptable. And honestly, I, I would have expected the ESA to personally, to each individual or company that, that was on that list, that they should have come out and apologized for it and said, look, we, we really screwed up here and we will do better. Yeah, and, and the fact that they could not do that just makes me... It just I don't have any trust in them and like as I said earlier this is a company who didn't care about my privacy but I'm supposed to believe they care about my health this year right I I, I unfortunately a part of me does believe that they might do shows on no matter what and they may only cancel if they are forced because all the big publishers pulled out and then they just want to save face and say, look, we do care. Otherwise, I could see them sitting and saying, oh, yeah, the whole state of California is on a state of emergency. Um, Nintendo's not coming. Microsoft's not coming. EA Square, you know, they're not coming. But for some reason, you know, we're still go- we're still going to be open for business. So you guys can still attend if you just want to network. And it's like, no, you guys are still putting money ahead of everything else. And right. That's it's really it's a messy situation i really do think it's a no win for them and some of it is it falls on this they are so squarely to blame for yeah. how the situation turned out like not with not with everything i mean it's some of this is you know it's nature it's it's a virus <laughs> you can't you can't plan for that you can't that's not their fault but they created a monster in what E3 had become with the doxing situation, their reluctance to adapt and evolve, their behind the scenes stuff that had Jeff Keighley cringe. And as you said, Jeff Keighley is a hype man. He is a, this may not be the best terminology to use, but he is a man who will sell your product. He is a man for hire. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he is looking at whatever the ESA is doing behind the scenes and saying, I'm distancing myself from this. And now that I am 8-bit is also distancing themselves from it really makes you wonder what horrendous idea is the ESA toying with for E3 2020? Yeah, that and, cause and, to... and I am 8-bit. I mean, they're, they're just a, I'm not saying small, but they're, they're a, a smaller manufacturer of 
retro games and controllers and you know all the kind of the throwback stuff right like they they'll re republish kind of old games on the super nes again and so you wonder you know it, to, for, for them to step away from the situation you would be thinking that with an opportunity of a company like i'm 8-bit to basically run the the e3 show start to finish and manage it themselves i mean anyone would be chomping at the bit to get that opportunity especially a company like i am 8-bit and then for them to to step away in the way that they did i think you're right i think there's a lot there that that has occurred that we we don't know about and we probably never will but i mean f for a company like i am 8-bit to step away really just is very very telling to me that there is a lot more going on that we'll probably ever know about right i mean it'd be like if the esa knocking on one of our doors saying hey we want you to be you know we we want you guys to MC the microsoft show i mean obviously we you know jump at the opportunity and yep. i mean i'd have to see some really disturbing stuff backstage to say i'm out especially three months ahead of when it's supposed to happen like it's either i mean i would say it's definitely not a budget thing because that would have been agreed upon well before they began work so this is something that is currently happening and hopefully we do find out exactly what their planning is that's is scaring people away mm -hmm. i mean it maybe it is just the influencer bit where it's just leaning too heavy into it and it's like no guys we're not you know we're not being a that that shill marketing you know nonsense we're not doing that with this type of show we're out or you know it could just be something far more severe and far more damaging but yep hopefully one day we find out maybe someone does an internal investigation maybe a memo leaks from some of the esa employees who are fed up with the situation as that is commonly how certain stories are broken it's just a disgruntled employee who's had enough yeah i, I think something stinks here and usually you know things will, will will come come out at some point and i think we'll hopefully we'll find out you know what what's really been going on there and and um you know get the the real take on on the situation behind the scenes yeah but let's hope that does happen so everyone that is our episode of nate the hate for this week if you enjoyed the video give the video a like if you did not give it a dislike be sure to leave your thoughts in the comment section below and once again thank you for joining us again mvg oh it's a pleasure sir thanks for having me on always always great to have you on and until next time, everyone, continue to embrace the hate.